In this week's update, multiple index breakouts on US job data, how to play the current rotation, and staying with the trends in your game plan. My name's Gary Davis, and as always, this is general advice only. And remember to subscribe and like the video. Let's just have a quick overall perspective uh, look at what's going on around the world. Um, the smart way to play this market, you know, the, the markets have been confusing people since the GFC in 2008. And a lot of people have just been shaking their heads and saying, well, how can it be? You know, look at what's happening around us. How can the market keep going up and up? But the fact is the market has been going up for 12 years. So the smart way to play this current situation that we find ourselves in is rather than trying to pick a top, which a lot of people are doing at the moment, is just to put your focus on risk management around your game plan. So your game plan will reflect the risk management that will hopefully deliver the, the outcomes that you want with the sort of risk that you're prepared to tolerate. And just focus on that because we can't control where the, where the top is going to be. That's just a guessing game. So that's where the focus needs to be <clears throat> and just control what it is that we can control. And most things are within our control. Um, you know, we, we can't control the, the short-term fluctuations of the market, but we can control what stocks we buy, how much exposure we have, how we enter, how we take profits. Most of the things are within our control. Now, most people would agree that you speak to that the market just can't be right in the face of all this terrible news, which not only includes the virus lockdown and all the economic consequences of that, but now we've got civil unrest uh, around the world. So that's the consensus agreement. But guess what? You know, the price action at the end of the day is always right. And when you look behind a lot of the things that are going on at the moment and understand how markets work, it becomes evident that the market's going up because a lot of it, it's to the advantage of a lot of vested interests. And so following the money and following the vested interests generally delivers a much better outcome than, um, than you know, going with what you think should be. All right, let's move on to American stocks. Just before I do that, though, I'd just like to thank um, all, the, uh, all the members and, uh, and non-members who've uh, provided me with, um, with terrific feedback and support this year. It's been a, an amazing journey. And, um, you know, overwhelmingly, I think people really appreciate the content that's in this, uh, in this video every week. So thank you to all those people. So American stocks, uh, the S&P, uh, I wrote on Thursday to, uh, to members that both the S&P and the NASDAQ were sitting at, um, at significant uh, double tops, uh, and they were. And with everything going on, that this would be an ideal time to see some sort of consolidation or, uh, or pullback. Well, the jobs data uh, came in just so much better in America than what anyone could have uh, expected. The, the economists were expecting a significant further surge in unemployment and loss of jobs. And in fact, what actually happened was that the jobs number went positive in May. Um, <clears throat> quite extraordinary. And that just really fired the market up. And so we saw both the S&P uh, and the NASDAQ uh, basically break above, um, above key resistance levels. And so and it really was a very robust uh, breakout. So we've been hearing this since 2008, that this is going to end badly. You know, central banks can't keep printing money at the rate that they're doing and stocks can't keep going up in value as they are and it's all going to end very badly but it never seems to and those that needed to be right those people that are stomping their feet and saying you know this just isn't right this just can't be have been really badly left behind and so yet again it's um it's just an, another lesson that you've got to follow the money and follow the trend in the market now, right at the moment, <clears throat> we're getting a sector rotation that started about a week and a half, two weeks ago. This is normal. So after the crash, the money goes into the sectors that will tend to lead. 
<clears throat> in this case, that was um, in the US, mainly technology and, um, and healthcare. Um, and there were a couple of other uh, sectors. Uh, consumer discretionary was doing okay. Um, but it was technology and healthcare that led the way. But now we're seeing the sectors that have been very badly affected, <coughs> beg your pardon, uh, such as airlines, travel companies, um, energy and the like, and they're experiencing a rebound as well. Now, this is all normal, and it's not necessarily indicating that everything's getting, getting back to normal for those sectors. It's just a price rebound from drastically oversold, and there's also a fair amount of short squeeze going on. In other words, uh, people that have been short those sectors of the market are, are buying back to cover their short position, to effectively take profit. And so what you end up with is instead of all this selling pressure, you end up with basically most people on the buying side and hardly anyone is selling anymore. And so naturally, you're going to get a rebound. But the point that I'll make now, and I'll make it later in the video, is that you've got two choices. You can either stay with the sectors that are growing their earnings very strongly, growing their revenues very strongly, and have got tailwinds as a sector. And so therefore, the trend is highly likely to be sustained um, in all time frames. Or you can put your money, you know, try and gamble on a rebound, which is largely based around short covering, which is unpredictable, it's unreliable, and it's temporary. And those sectors are facing significant headwinds. You know, you can't tell me that the travel industry and the airline industry and, and the energy industry, all of a sudden, it, everything is going back to normal and everything's going to be absolutely fine because it's not. So those sectors are facing headwinds for quite some time to come. So do you want to try and play that sector or do you want to go with reliability and high probability? You know, I know where my money goes every time. So yes, there are some trading opportunities in, in this sector rotation. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that you shouldn't participate at all. So if you want to trade it short term with strong risk management rules, then yeah, go ahead. But in terms of investing long term in these sectors, I know where I'll put my money. Now, the US dollar has come off uh, quite a bit since um, since March. It was over 100 um, and now we're, we're down uh, under 97. But we did see the 10-year yield, which had been stuck around about the 0.65% level for uh, most of the last couple of months, uh, suddenly shot up as well. So again, a bit of an indicator of, um, of the, the expected improved outlook. Let's take a look at some charts. <clears throat> so we'll start first of all with the, uh, <coughs> big pardon, with the S&P. This is on a monthly chart, and I just wanted to go back and touch again on what I uh, covered last week and the fact that uh, I, <clears throat> I actually signaled somewhat um, cautiously and somewhat sheepishly back in 2013 that I, that I felt it was possible that the market was breaking out into a new secular bull market. So secular means long term, you know, you, you'd be thinking at least a decade or two, whereas cyclical are the shorter term cycles. So from 2000 to 2013, we were in a secular bear market. And often that's what you see in when you look at it at a big picture level. It's, it's, it appears to be going sideways, but that's typically how most uh, bear markets look uh, at, uh, at a big picture level. So within that secular bear market from 2000 to 2013, we had uh, two significant uh, cyclical bear markets from 2000 to 2003, and then again from 2007 to 2009, so two cyclical bear markets, and then we had two cyclical bull markets, this one here running up to 2007, and then of course the one coming out of the GFC. So that whole period is a cyclical bear market, so sorry, a secular bear market, and that this breakout above those very significant highs in 2013 was the start of the next secular bull market. 
Now, along the way, what have we had? We've, we've certainly just had a cyclical bear market. You could argue we had another one in, um, in the end of 2018 that only lasted three months. But it's quite clear now, seven years on, that that's what we're in. And it's quite possible, and this isn't a prediction by any stretch of the imagination, I'm just saying that secular bull markets tend to run for at least 10 to 15 and sometimes 20 years. We're only seven years in. So I wouldn't dis dismiss the possibility that this secular bull market could continue for quite some period of time. Now, within that, I'm almost certain that we're going to get some more events like we saw at the, the last quarter of 2018, which hurt. And what we've just seen here, which hurt those who certainly weren't, uh, you know, didn't have the game plan set up to, um, to deal with it, and <clears throat> perhaps sold at the lows and failed to buy back in, then I'm certain we're going to see more of those sort of events. But only as part of an overall rising trend. Time will tell, but I wouldn't be getting too bearish and thinking that you've got to avoid the stock market because it's it's quite possible that we've got some of the uh, some of the best periods ahead of us that we've seen in the last uh, several decades. Let's zero in. Look at the daily. So here was the uh, here was the key double top that the S and P was sitting at on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and then it's broken out. Uh, we're almost at thirty two hundred points. In fact, it did go over thirty two hundred points on Friday night. The all time highs are only uh, two hundred points above that. So you can see we've recovered, uh, getting up towards 85, 90% of, um, of the decline that occurred in, uh, in February, March. If you look at the NASDAQ, we're in a similar situation. We were sitting there on Wednesday and Thursday at, uh, at a very significant double top. This is all-time highs. So as opposed to the S&P, which wasn't at all-time highs, but this one is. And we've now broken to uh, to another new all-time high on Friday night. So uh, pretty amazing price action in the States. And when you look across the sectors, it's very broadly based and it's including small caps. So this is not the indexes just breaking out because, you know, the FANG stocks are doing really well. This is very broadly based. Okay, let's look at the currency. So you can see we've had quite a steep decline in the US dollar. Um, and we, we're getting now down uh, towards support. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what, uh, what happens with the US dollar. We know that the US authorities will want the US dollar lower and they'll be doing everything that they can, how much impact they're having <clears throat> and how much of it is about uh, you know, perceptions of the economy, the unrest um, is, you know, I, I won't, uh, I won't um, try and uh, conjecture on that, but certainly the US dollar has been weak relative to other currencies. The Australian dollar has been a beneficiary of that, but there's also been several other reasons that has um, caused the Australian dollar to spike uh, almost to 70. So you can see we we were in a long-term downtrend. The 200-day moving average is still heading down. We've now spiked above it. Um, we, we really need to break above these highs to signal an overall change in direction for the Australian dollar. Um, I'm not, I don't have any particular opinion about where the Australian dollar is going. I just note the price action as it unfolds. And prior to this week, um, as we were still below the 200-day moving average, then uh, from my perspective, the Australian dollar was still in a downtrend. We had a little sp spike at the end of uh, 2019. We've got another spike at the moment. Um, that needs to be sustained. We could always uh, come back down and resume the downtrend. Okay, let's look at the Australian market while we're here. So this is the ASX 200. So we've managed to break above the 50% retracement level. Haven't quite made it to the 61.8. We've been considerably weaker than the US. And that's really a reflection of the mix of our um, 
of our index, the fact that it's so heavy in banks and, uh, and material stocks and uh, the banks were holding it back. Um, but it was, uh, it's only very recently, so the 26th of May, the, the banks really started to move. And I guess that's a reflection of the, the better than expected uh, recovery from, uh, from the virus lockdown. Now, whether that enthusiasm is warranted or not, we'll we'll see in time. But certainly the market at the moment is betting that economically, countries around the world are going to recover um, far quicker than was first thought. So the Aussie stocks, uh, <clears throat> 69.5 is where we finished. But in addition to the US dollar weakness, uh, the iron ore prices remained very strong. That has led to us having a current account surplus. Um, and also there was a, an extremely good article in The Australian through the week written by Robert Gottliebson that talked about how the Australian institutions, which have got uh, hedging in place to cover their overseas investments, kind of got, got that hedging uh, really mucked up and have been forced to, uh, to chase the Australian dollar to cover their, uh, their international exposure. So all those things have come together to very surprisingly uh, force the Australian dollar up to, uh, to where it is at the moment. Now our index rose by 4.2% on the week, so a strong finish and one would think we're probably going to see some more strength on, uh, on Monday given what happened in the US. Um, our banks are rising, it's a similar sort of rotation to what we're seeing overseas. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, all's going to be well for all sectors of the Australian economy, the reality is the banks are still going to face headwinds, whereas a lot of technology stocks are, are experiencing tremendous tailwinds. So for me, I still prefer growth stocks that have got uh, unquestionable enduring tailwinds because we know that the growth in the top line and the bottom line is going to be there and the prices will track that earnings growth. I much prefer those to try to pick value stocks that yes, they're oversold and yes, they can rebound. And some of the percentage gains are, um, you know, might seem quite attractive. But those sectors and those stocks are facing headwinds for years and years to come. And so the rebound that we're seeing becomes more risky. It becomes more unpredictable. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. Turning to precious metals, gold fell $45 to finish under $1,700 again. So the, this in, increasing enthusiasm, this increasing optimism around the world is naturally taking, taking its toll on gold because part of the reason that gold had spiked up was the fear of, uh, of numerous things. <coughs> now, some of those things are still there. The... Uh, you know, the steady debasement of fiat currencies, the, um, uh, you know, the, the tampering with the, the basic concepts of the monetary system, the, the concept of a risk-free rate, those things are still there. The possibility of significant inflation in the future because of all this money printing is still there. It's just at the moment, there's a receding fear about the virus and the lockdown and the impact on the economy. And so some of the premium is coming out of gold. But there are some positives. There are two things that drive the gold price. Speculators in the futures market using high degrees of leverage tend to kick trends off. They get them started. They provide the, the spark that gets the trend going. But there's not enough money there to sustain those trends long term in the futures market. And they're highly susceptible to selling out on, on small moves downwards. What sustains the rise in the gold price are investors, long term investors that come in all sorts of different forms. And there's plenty of, in, of evidence and data that supports the fact that investors are buying up big time. In fact, we've seen in the last few months, we've seen some of the biggest increases by investors in, uh, in GLD, in the, in the amount of uh, gold being held in uh, ETFs that track, um, track the underlying metal. 
So that tells me that that trend in gold is is far more sustainable once long term investors get involved. So the weekly uptrend, as we'll see, remains very intact. Now GDX, we've had a classic breakout on a weekly chart, and now we've just had a little retest. So that's all pretty normal. And from my perspective, these regular corrections are keeping the trend quite healthy and quite sustainable. It's when gold stocks just go up and up and up for month after month after month that you end up with a crash at the end of it because it just all gets too far ahead of itself. So what we're seeing at the moment, whilst I know it's a little frustrating for a few uh, a few people that might be just entering the gold market for the first time and, and wondering why you know why gold stocks are just sort of going up and down in the one spot um, it's because we're getting this consolidation and it's and it's actually a good thing because it'll allow the trend to be sustained for for much longer and for much further what's really important if you're going to be involved in the gold market and the silver market for the long term and I believe there's a very strong uh, big picture case to do that You've got to recognize that this is a very volatile sector and so therefore you need a very clear game plan around that and i think a very good way to attack it is to is to hold some core positions that you're going to hold for the long term for several years size them at a level that you that you can accommodate the fluctuations and then have a trading portion that allow you to if you get it right register some profits sequentially along the way, which makes it easier then to sit on your core position. So for me, that's that's the best mix of uh, allowing yourself to, to get uh, exposure to what is a very lucrative, but also quite volatile sector. So let's look at some charts. We'll start with um, <clears throat> with the daily chart. So you can see we, we certainly had some significant moves down in the gold price. We were trading up on Tuesday at uh, around 17.35 and then we had fairly decent moves on Wednesday and again on Friday. Uh, but you can see close well off the lows. So there's still obviously buying coming in. Um, I just think looking at the overall price action that we probably won't see too much further down in, uh, in gold in the short term but look whatever it does it all gets back to your trading plan we can't control whether the price of gold is going to go lower or not but we certainly can control our game plan let's look at the weekly chart you can see we've got this very very steep uptrend that started in September of uh, September October of 2018 we are still within that overall uh, big picture uptrend we're only just a little bit under halfway in that in the midpoint of that channel, um, so really nothing has changed in terms of the uh, the trend in gold. And if you look at silver, silver is also uh, playing some catch up um, with uh, with gold. Silver got hit a lot harder than gold during the crash, but it has rebounded. It is still the ratio is still out of whack. Silver needs to continue outperforming gold to get back to where it uh, would normally be um, but it, it's certainly um, certainly heading in the right direction and if we just have a quick look at GDX so GDX on a weekly chart so this goes back to the start of the big base formation in 2013 um, we had a, a breakout that occurred uh, in the third uh, week of April uh, we've now had a pullback to retest that breakout and um, I would expect that uh, we'll probably see some consolidation and hopefully a move higher from here in gold stocks. Turning to other commodities, copper firmed quite sharply up to 255. So again, um, you know, copper is a, a very good barometer of the expectations of economic activity. And so this very sharp rise in copper is certainly saying that there is an expectation amongst the smart money that, um, that the economic damage is going to be a lot less than what people first thought. Crude oil um, shot up another, I think it was probably about $5 on, uh, on the week, ended up at uh, $39. We've got US production is still falling. 
and uh, we've got OPEC and Russia agreeing to uh, to some cuts as well. So that's um, that's helping in the commodity space. Now the impact on stocks. So if we just have a look at um, uh, XLE, which is in the US. <clears throat> so this is the overall energy index in the US. So this covers uh, all three main sectors of the energy market. It covers producers, it covers drillers, and it covers the downstream. Uh, you can see we're a long, long way off the highs. The highs in 2014 were up around 90. Um, we crashed to about 23 in the crash, and, we're, and now we're, we're back to about the mid-40s at the moment. So still a long way to go. And this is one of these rebound trades that I was talking about at the start. The percentage gains, yes, are spectacular, but these are very risky, unpredictable, volatile sort of moves. So I would much rather uh, be involved in um, all the various areas of technology or healthcare than, uh, than trying to play uh, this sort of market at the moment. But different people like different risk profiles. Okay, this is the spot copper chart, so you can see we've spiked quite sharply uh, in the week, but we've really been recovering since uh, the end of March. So wrapping it up, the ongoing dilemma that a lot of people have, and I, I guess I'm in the fortunate position where I, I do get to talk to a lot of people, I get feedback from a lot of people, and nearly everyone is still shaking their head and you know looking at the market and thinking about the market in logical terms. You know what? <laughs> what should be given everything that's going on. So you got to decide whether you whether you want to respond to logic, or whether you want to make money out of the market. Because the 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 choice is almost that stark. You've you've got to look at the price action, and go with the price action, even though it might defy logic. Because that's that's where the where the money is. The key lesson for me has been learned yet again since the start of, since before the crash. And that is in a secular bull market, which is what we're in, we've been in it since 2013, the surprises are generally to the upside. In a secular bear market, the surprises tend to be to the downside. But we're in a bull market at the moment, so you don't want to be thinking about trying to pick tops and doom and gloom. You want to try and you know go with go with the trend. We're in a secular bull market. Yes, there'll be significant pullbacks, but the majority of the opportunities are to the upside. So stay with the trend. Portfolio analyst this week. Um, it's going to be doing some portfolio updates. We've been getting a lot of questions, a lot of very good questions from members of late, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of really good questions that are non-stock specific as well about. Um, portfolio construction, portfolio rebalancing. Uh, so it's really good to see those sort of questions coming through as well. So that's it for this week. For anyone who's not a member, there's more information on, on the website and there's my email address if anyone wants to contact me. That's it for this week. Cheers. <laughs>